There you go. All right, three, two, one. Hi, this is William Ramsey. Welcome to William Ramsey Investigates on tonight's show. I have two special guests. I have a returning guest, Ken Amin, who uh, is here, and we're going to discuss a book he published in 2017 called, or titled, The Occult Roots of Post-Genderism and a History of Changes to Psychiatry and Psychology. And I have a new guest. His name is Nicholas, and he just published a book on November 3rd, 2018, about a very timely subject of which we're going to discuss, Post-Genderism, War on the Binary. So, Ken and Nicholas, are you there? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Awesome. Hi, Thanks. How you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for being here. So I appreciate it. Uh, the, t the topic is post-genderism, a very timely topic. And I was just reading something today about a new political figure here in the States, uh, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, who says she's troubled by being a cisgendered woman. So... This uh, topic is popping up, but before we talk, get into the gist of your books, maybe we can start. Uh, Ken is a returning guest. He can just do a little bit about his background, and then Nicholas also talk about your background and how you got interested in this topic. Well, my the basic thing I'd like to say is, first of all, great to be back with you, William, and your audience. Always enjoy your shows, whether I'm on them or not. And um, yeah, I'm just basically a researcher, and I, I get myself involved in all kinds of um, sometimes obscure topics, such as this one. And um, as we were just speaking, uh, Nicholas and I, uh, about how many different angles there are to look at any one issue. So uh, we've kind of been learning from each other how much of a topic this is and how many ways there are to look at it. So, yeah, I mean, you, you mentioned post-genderism. I guarantee you virtually nobody even knows that word, much less uh, the concept behind it. And so Nicholas just contacted me through my website, and it blew my mind. I mean, somebody who knows the word post-genderism, much less looks at it from the same perspective I do, much less has also published a book about it. I mean, it was unbelievable. Um, so him and I kind of felt like we're just out there all alone taking on this new crazy topic. And uh, so it was really a blessing, Nicholas, to get in touch with you. And just it was really um, reassuring and um, helpful to know someone else is out there looking at the same topic. So go ahead, Nicholas. Give them your, your little – Yeah, well, yeah. <clears throat> first, first, first off, uh, hey, Will, hey, Ken, thank you. Thanks for having me on. Uh, it is a privilege to talk to you guys, um, your backgrounds. Um, my background, um, I'm a Christian. I've been in the church um, uh, most of my life. And just, you know, being in a culture uh, that, we're, that we're in now, there's a lot of um, weird things that are uh, said in the media, a lot of weird narratives um, pertaining to gender. And I work in a field that is strongly on logic. And as soon as I hear narratives or speech that talk about gender, I immediately can uh, recognize how illogical that they are. And what one thing that kind of sparked my interest into writing this book was the fact that there seemed to be no one that would speak up about the truth of just reality about uh, men and women. So that's kind of what got me into uh, researching more about what's going on in society, where is this going to go, um, what does God think about it, um, how does this relate to the Christian walk. So that, that's how I got into it. Um, and similar to what Ken was just talking about, I thought it was fascinating that uh, someone that I, I didn't know wrote on the same topic that I wrote about, and we were coming to the same, same conclusions on a lot of things, and I thought that that just attests to the truthness of what we were saying. And, you know, when, we, when you talk about post-genderism, and I'll, ex I'll explain what that is in just a second, <clears throat> it's, it's something that um, it sounds crazy when you say things like there are people that are trying to get rid of genders, but that's just the reality of the world that we live in, and that's what's going on. It's undeniable. Um, but it seems like no one will, like, like people are scared to say something about it, or they're scared to talk about it. Um, so I guess I'll go ahead and just define what post-genderism is or how I define it. And it's a okay. relative it's, yeah, it's yeah. A new term. So, Well, hold on. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to introduce the, the general topic, and then you can give us the definition. 
Okay, that works. So what I want to mention up front is um, something about transhumanism, and that's something that we'll get to eventually. But it's just that the first time I lectured on transhumanism, it was to a group that consisted of people that were mostly ranging in age from their 50s to their 80s. And I thought to myself, how on earth am I even going to breach a topic like transhumanism with uh, people who are essentially elderly? And what I hit upon, thank God, is that I gave him a parochial example, okay? So I, so I said, okay, think about the United States in the 60s, right? The sexual revolution, which was really a sexual devolution, and sexual freedom, which, of course, leads to sexual slavery. And that really, what came along with it is a divorce on demand, you know, um, the the beginnings of the breaking down of marriage and family. And that was an open door for homosexuality. And now homosexuality was an open door to the trans movement, the LGBTQIA plus movement, which is a whole range of phenomena really. And it's a very much more complex topic than simply homosexuality. But now the trans movement, it's opening the door for post-genderism. Now, you think about homosexuality, um, how long it took the American society to accept it. Well, I would say roughly half a century, right, from being uh, very openly aware of it to not only uh, saying that it's acceptable but celebrating it and passing special laws to protect people involved in that lifestyle. Yeah, that's a very important point. Yeah, just right. going from that to celebrating it. So, because you're seeing this progression, sorry. Right. So, maybe half a century, roughly. Now, how long did it take for trans the trans movement to get the same status? I would say pretty much overnight. <laughs> I mean, the, the, ma the nanosecond that uh, same sex marriage was approved, oh, trans the trans movement was absolutely everywhere instantly and gained a special status. Uh, I mean, we're talking social, politically, and religiously. So special laws being passed and actual religious rights being performed to mark transitions. So you're talking about a progression of, uh, of half a century for homosexuality and literally overnight for the trans movement. And so the, the point is the trans movement was brewing underground and in just the snap of a finger, it just surfaced all over the place, all over the world now. And so what Nicholas and I have our eye on is the next thing. <laughs> and the next thing is post-genderism. Now, I don't know if it's going to be manifested under the term genderism because, for instance, transhumanism is also known as um, humanity plus or futurism. Um, so in, in other words, there's various different terms. So when we see this next thing, you might not recognize it under the term post-genderism, but it is the next thing. So now I think is a good time for Nicholas to tell us what that is. Yeah. Um, I like the way you put that. The term that I think that they're going to try to use is what they're using right now. It's the gender neutral term. Uh, there's been a number of celebrities that came out and said that they're going to raise their um, child gender neutral or genderless. That's effectively what we're talking about uh, when we say post-gender, post Right, or gender fluidity. Yeah. Gender There's already many terms for that, yeah. <laughs> right, yeah, okay. gender fluid fluidity, uh, basically meaning it's, it's not a defined gender. So, yeah, post-genderism, post meaning after, and we're talking about gender, it's after genders, after the classification of genders, which obviously is, um, is male and female. So a post, post genderism uh, is anything that forms the, the, the male and female genders are worthless, worthless bondage, or are inferior. Um, and if you just listen to some of the narratives in our society, we can already hear people um, trying to highlight or lift up people that claim to be transgender or non-binary. It's almost like they're getting the elevated status over just regular people. 
Um, I mean, and then that gets into you know, intersectionality and um, people feeling like um, it, 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 it's social currency to be a victim or to be strange or to be odd or to be really just um, not what God created. Um, so that's that's how I would define postgenderism. Gotcha. And what I mean, maybe what we can do, you know, you this this lead up to postgenderism is look at the roots. Ken talked about the occult roots, and you covered how feminism informed this postgenderism, and maybe those are things that we can look into right now. Right, because. Um, it's okay. Postgenderism is definitely tied into transhumanism. So we can uh, just point out that inevitably transhumanism involves high tech uh, concepts of evolution and theology and, and or the occult. It's inevitable that one, two or three of those elements will be involved in it somehow. And so let me give you a more technical definition of postgenderism that I'm pulling from a paper by George Dvorsky and James Hughes from the Institute of Ethics and Emerging Technologies. And it's called Postgenderism Beyond the Gender Binary. Okay, so they write, and actually I found that uh, the definition Nicholas gave touched upon a lot of the very same points that these guys make in their paper. So they say postgenderism is an extrapolation of ways that technology is eroding the biological, psychological, and social role of gender, and an argument for why the erosion of binary gender will be literary. Postgenderists argue that gender is an arbitrary and necessary limitation on human potential and foresee the elimination of involuntary biological and psychological gendering in the human species through the application of neurotechnology, biotechnology, and reproductive technologies. Okay, so there we see uh, the basic evolutionary premise behind postgenderism and transhumanism, which is, well, why is it that uh, the norm is male or female? Why is that? Why is there a gender binary? Well, on their worldview, that's just an accident. It's just literally a random chance, unguided accident, mutation somewhere along the way of human evolution that just so happens to make it so that we're male and female. So if it's just an accident, unguided, unplanned, uh, then why should I adhere to it? Why should I be forced to be a male or a female, uh, both uh, at every level, uh, emotionally, psychologically, uh, physically, right? It's not just that I can put on someone else, uh, another gender's clothing, but I can now, through technology, literally change my body to resemble the other gender. But now what's happening is people are, like Nicholas was saying so well, they're coming to the point where they're saying things like, well, if I'm a male, why should I transition into a female? I mean, why can't I be both? Or why can't I be neither? Or why can't I be a brand new gender of my own invention? Right. And now that's going quickly going beyond merely self-affirmation -affirm or self-identification, but it's becoming anatomical to the point where if I want to invent a brand new gender, pretty soon I'll be able to literally do that anatomically through high tech, you know? I mean, right. you, you could probably already uh, 3D print yourself a new Schmeckel or something like that. <laughs> right. Well, that's interesting. I mean, it's interesting you use that quote because uh, Nicholas used that. I don't know if you're aware, but Nicholas used that mm -hmm. code in his, uh, quote in his chapter six of postgenderism was something that I copied and pasted into my notes. Yeah, so, I'm telling you, it's it's amazing how Nicholas and I were just going right down the same road. <clears throat> yeah, That's something cool. something I want to point out in the, the definition that you just read uh, from that abstract 
is they say that uh, uh, and then um, I'm gonna just I'm gonna just read it, uh, summarize the part that I want to focus on really quick. It says postgenerism is an extrapolation of the ways that technology is eroding the biological and psychological social role of gender, and it's an argument for why the erosion of the binary gender will be liberatory. Now, I I take that word liberatory, and I just take a second and think about what does that mean? What are they trying to say liberatory? Um, that means to be free from something, to be free from something that's constraining you or that's keeping you in bondage or that's keeping you in a lesser state. And I think, and I agree 100% with, with what you said and how this ties into uh, transhumanism because what, what the idea is, is that if I'm a male or if I'm a female, I need to somehow be liberated from this bondage that I'm in. It's, it's, it sounds very similar to Gnosticism and how I'm in a state and I need to get free with some type of information technology or something that can liberate me from the binary gender that I'm born in. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty that is a big statement to make that it is, is a Gnostic-like concept because it was created by some kind of um, senile god, right? And so... Uh, therefore, all matter is evil. So, therefore, the gender binary or physical bodies are evil. So, what we're really seeing is that we, humanity, especially in first world countries, are in such a frenzied fever pitch of rebelling against God that the key term is deconstruction, right? We've de deconstructed ethics, we've deconstructed philosophy. Now, uh, with this movement, we're starting to deconstruct actual science itself, and we're deconstructing ourselves because notice that the statement was technology is eroding the biological yakety yak, right? Well, wait a minute. Technology is nothing. Te I mean, technology is not a being. <laughs> right. It has no volition. It has no existence. So what do you mean technology is eroding? No, no, no. We, our use of technology is doing that, Right. <laughs> And so if we find that uh, this issue going on with gender, I, I view it as a, an art of war tactic where a war isn't just what take, takes place on the battlefield between two armies. A war is fought on every conceivable front. It's economic. It's sociological. It's uh, through the arts, through literature. It's in every conceivable way that you can fight your war, you're going to fight the art of war. And that's what's happening right now. It's in our schools. It's in the media. It's in the news. It's in movies. And the point is that it's being done on purpose. It's not just that, oh, kids nowadays, they just got a heavy dose of uh, 60s sexual revolution. It's not. Let me read you a little bit more from that paper I quoted, okay? Yes. Uh, Efforts to treat female depression and male aggression, autism and ADD, would give us ways to make the brain more androgynous. Francis Fukuyama lamented these trends, the masculinizing of depressive women's moods by antidepressants, and the feminizing of ADD boys with stimulant med medications. In our post-human future, asserting that they were the result of pressure to conform androgynous median personality in American society. And um, so if, if you notice there, the key point is, for one, how many children are on hardcore pharmaceuticals nowadays? I don't know what the percentage is. It's a lot. It's a lot. Okay, so what they're saying, notice the statement. It would give us ways to make the brain more androgynous. This is being done purposefully. Uh, and so what they're doing is basically it comes down to this. Okay, let's say you're a, a girl and your body has been designed with the DNA, with the genetics, to build the body of a woman with the brain of a woman with the physicality of a woman, with the desires of a woman, but then it's being flooded with uh, testosterone, right, through the medication. 
and vice versa with the boy. The boy's being flooded with estrogen or pseudoestrogens. So their bodies are literally biochemically confused. And so that's why you end up seeing all these kids who are basically blob-like, right? It's hard to tell if they're male or female. It's not just because they choose to look androgynous, although they end up doing that, but it's because their, their biochemistry is literally confused. Right. And so their brains are literally confused. And so their emotions are literally confused. Jeez, and their right. spirituality is literally confused. So the generation, you know, when you of, end up here, generation of Pats and Chris's. Right. And the thing is, you hear about the statistics of the suicide rates and the LGBTQIA plus community and off the charts high. It's just, it's a tragedy. It's an absolute tragedy how many youngsters are, are literally dying because of this movement. Yeah. And then the, the kickback you always get is, oh, that's because they were bullied. You know, if people like you just would accept them, then they would be okay. And that's not the case because studies show that even in countries that are extremely welcoming to their lifestyles, the suicide rates are still off the charts. So it's not that simple. What you have to look at is, look, within their bodies, there's literally – Art of wars. There's wars going on. There's biological uh, confusion, like I said, emotional confusion, psychological confusion, spiritual confusion. And, and these poor people just end up not knowing what to do with themselves because they're so conflicted on so many levels. And again, back to my point, it's being done on purpose. Yeah, it, 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 is, it, is, it, is, it is so bad. I mean, I, I think uh, it's, it's amazing that it's not talked about everywhere when you when you hear about what they're doing to little children. I mean, I read an article earlier today about a a, a father who's uh, fighting for for his son, who his ex wife is trying to basically make his son transition into a girl, and he's only six years old. And it's just like, why is this why is this even a thing? Why are we even talking about a six year old boy transforming into a girl? Like that's not even it's not even possible. I mean, and so I mean, it's it's just crazy, but. It's, it's, it's happening activism in the UK. By the parents. But you know what? That yeah. in the UK they had a case like that where the transition and somebody complained and they, uh, they I forgot they, they either got civilly sued or they actually it was uh, the the cops showed up to ask the person who said that that's not right that the mother should be able to transition an underage son under the age of consent into a woman and the cops showed up at that person's house. It was it was on Horsley's show. Autoculture. I remember reading about that. It's it's bizarre because a, a sixteen year old um, can at that time get a driver's license. I guess depending on where you live, but they can't drink, they can't vote, they can't join the military, they can't do all these things. They can't sign a contract. They're not. Yeah, they can't, they're not legally. Can't, contracts won't be legally binding. Right. They can't do all these things because uh, we, as a society, recognize that little children don't have the capacity to make uh, very important decisions that will be life, you know, lasting, lifelong lasting. And so, I mean, in what world, how, how is, in what world would it be okay to allow a child to mutilate their bodies or to undergo, um, I guess, what, what do they call it, transitioning, right. something that's irreversible? I mean, once, is, once the, dump, the damage is done, there's no turning back. There's, no there's going no back. back. And if you look at some of the men who've changed themselves into women, I think the statistics of regret amongst them are close to 50% after they get it done. So it, there's, there's no going back, but they've had these, these sex change operations as an adult and regret it. Um, but I think this is a good place to stop. Let's stop right now, and then we'll reopen another meeting, okay? No. Yeah, so I wanted to mention that um, – there is actually just thing as transitioning one way and then transitioning back because of regret. In fact, just in October of last year, Walt Heyer, H-E-Y-E-R, he published a book called Trans Life Survivors. And it's just that. It's stories about people who transitioned and then ended up regretting it. So they went back to their original gender. Well, 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 yeah, I, I, I read some cases about that, but my uh, concern is that once you introduce uh, hormones to a child, um, they're going to go through 
uh, traumatic experiences. You know, I mean, if they can revert back, uh, I think that's good, but the damage has been done. So uh, I think that's more what I was uh, speaking to. No, you're absolutely right because, like I said, it's a biochemical war. I mean, you're actually – uh, introducing substances into your body that are changing it at a fundamental level. In fact, I've heard of what's called gender affirming hormones. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing to, to think that. Wow. It's like the hormones are what they are, but it, like I said, it's, it's being done purposefully and biochemically. And I said interesting that Baphomet is the creature that's worshipped uh, in the occult and Satanism. And Baphomet is a half man, half woman goat. And looking at your book on page 16, and I, I'm not going to try to pronounce this, but basically you were pointing out how the writings on his arm basically mean alchemy, chemistry, and solution and dissolution. And it's all that co 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 coagula? It, it, it's all that coagula? Quagla, yeah, yeah. And and this image, I believe, is very old. And I find it so interesting how the concept of this imagery is alive and well in our society today. It and goes back to Eliphas, Le Ele Eliphas Levy, who uh, wrote Key to the Mysteries and some other books, but uh, well, well, he died me, in 1875, yeah. Yeah, let, let me take you guys one step back. And I'll just kind of make an assertion because I've not been able to really narrow, uh, point, nail this down with details. But the fact is that, and I'm sure you saw this in the book, Nicholas, uh, Baphomet is really the mirror image version of an earlier illustration by Levi, by Eliphas Levi, that is called Azima, A Z um, I M A. Okay, and it's a, a, a much more simple illustration, but it's the same kind of concept. You can see the two genders. You can see the Promethean torch on its head, and it's a mirror image of Baphomet. Now, he claimed that what he did is to illustrate an ancient Assyrian idol. Um, that I've not been able to verify. I did write to a, a ancient history professor and I'm trying to dig up a few others that might be able to verify that for me or not. But anyhow, that's just a claim. Uh, and actually, you find that um, uh, Azima is mentioned in the Bible, just really in passing. And you usually find it uh, spelled in English as A-S-H-I-M-A. Interesting. Okay. Now, like I said, it's just mentioned in passing. It doesn't describe what the idol looked like, but it is in the Bible. So if this is all accurate that he got it from an ancient idol, then this is extremely ancient. And that's what we find. And that's why um, the title of my book was The Occult Roots of Postgenderism. Because what you find is that in occultism, the concept of the God or the, the perfect conception of God, and therefore the perfect conception of the original human being, was either hermaphroditic or androgynous. It's, it's basically both genders combined, because any division is seen as evil, right? So the right. ultimate fulfillment of human beings is to attain the state of unification again. So that you won't have male or female anymore, but everybody will be more godlike, and that means having both genders. Yeah, i.e., I, I, post genderism or right. androgynous. Um, if you want, I could uh, I could read you a few quotes to that effect, really quick. If you want, yeah, please do. Yeah, uh, this is by Magus Incognito. I, I have a feeling that might possibly be a pseudonym. <laughs> Magus Incognito <laughs> wrote a book called The Secret Doctrine of the Rosicrucians. That's in 1918. And he says the tradition that mankind was anciently hermaphrodite is world old. And then Manly P. Hall in The Secret of All Ages, 1928, he says that man was primarily androgynous is quite universally conceded 
and it is a reasonable presumption that he will ultimately regain his bisexual state. Wow. Uh, my book is just saturated with quotations from occult sources saying exactly that same sort of thing. Right. Yeah. And and that's, one of that, that's why I'll read you guys one quote from Crowley because that's what come to, came to mind. I was talking to Ken about it, but really one of the keys of Crowley is really this paragraph because it reveals his real uh, Satanism and uh, Luciferianism. But uh, when he says, he says, the devil historically, the God of any people is one that personally, the one that personally dislikes. This has led to much confusion of the thought that the B666 Crowley has to prefer to let's name, name stand as they are and proclaim simply that Awaz, the solar phallic hermetic Lucifer, is his own holy guardian angel. The devil Satan had it. This serpent Satan is not the enemy of man, but he who made gods of our race, knowing good and evil. And he bade know thyself and taught initiation. He is the devil of the book of Thoth, and his emblem is Baphomet, which we talked about. The androgyne, who is the hieroglyph of arcane perfection. So this uh, androgyny is... Perfection in Arcania. Pretty interesting. Called it according to Crowley. And, and, and that's exactly what Nicholas mentioned up front, which is this is about Gnosticism, because Gnosticism basically takes every single biblical, biblical doctrine and turns it inside out, upside down, and backwards, so that the Creator God ends up being a delusional, arrogant God, and then Satan plays the the role of the Savior who comes. And literally enlightens humanity by uh, giving us to eat of the tree of the knowledge and good and evil. And that, that ends up being symbolically displayed as the Promethean torch, like you see on Baphomet's head. But uh, Nicholas hit it on the nail, the nail on the head again by basically referring to how this is all about alchemy. Right. Okay. And so basically, just very, very basic term. Alchemy basically refers to the breaking down, the deconstruction of the self to be followed by a reconstruction and that's exactly what we're doing today through mm. the, these movements wow. as humanism and post-humanism as we're destroying God's creation we're destroying God's created purpose for gender which is uh, family sex and marriage and we're recreating it in our own image it's, it's, exact, it's exactly what it is it's a Gnostic alchemical process yeah, you know, I I, I agree one hundred percent. But you know, when we use language, you know, dealing with, um, uh, that have a religious context, I think a lot of people in the social arena um, they kind of they don't want to hear that. And so there's the the same things being said in the media now, all over the place. They they just use different terminology for the exact same thing. So they don't use the terminology alchemy. They'll use the term, terminology of something like uh, um, uh, hormonal therapy or something like that. Yeah. But we're, we're effectively even, talking about the same thing. Right. Or even empowerment. <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah. Like it's, um, and, uh, and I do want to talk about, before we, so before we get off the topic, how feminism uh, plays a huge role in um, changing the mindsets of people to accept these things. Um, and yeah, go, go ahead and do that because uh, I notice that nowadays masculinity, masculinity is being referred to as toxic. Right. Uh, but uh, being LGBTQIAP plus is perfectly normal and natural. And while masculinity is is toxic, uh, femininity, especially hyper femininity, um, feminism, is basically we're transitioning to a matriarchal society. And I hate to say this, but it's true. In every place in history where you see any kind of matriarchy, it basically ends up in sex and blood. Right? <laughs> exactly. Destruction. Right. Yeah. yeah so why don't you talk about that, Nicholas? Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, let, let, me say, um, let me say some context real quick. Um, before I wrote this book, I was baffled that the LGBTQA plus community was able to accomplish so much in our society and do so much so quickly without a whole lot of backlash. And I was, I asked myself, how are they able to do this? And then now you see things like the promotion of transgenderism and it makes no sense, but how are they able to push this where mainstream media or where, where, where as a society, people just begin to accept it and people don't just say, this is crazy. We're going to stop listening to outlets pushing this stuff. 
and I, I believe I found out what the answer is. I, um, after writing my book, I came to the conclusion for myself, and this may be just my opinion, that the LGBT um, and the transgenders, they are not the ones primarily pushing the LGBT agenda. It's really the feminists behind all of this that are pushing this agenda. And after, you know, so when I, when I was doing research um, on some of the, um, uh, some, some of the pioneers of the feminist movement in our modern era, I found out that pretty much all of them were either atheists, they were either into the occult, or they either just hated God. And the basis of feminism is post-generism hidden. And I say that because, you know, it's, it's, it's sometimes it's hard for people to define what feminism is, and, and that makes sense. I mean, they claim to fight for climate control and all kinds of other things. But one thing that everyone knows that feminists are for is the understanding that we should treat men and women the same. And, and that we should have the same expectations for men and women. Now, on the surface, that sounds fair. That sounds nice. But if you really understand what that means, it's fundamentally flawed be, for the obvious reason. And the obvious reason is that men and women are different. And so to have the same expectations for, uh, from, some, from, from, from two groups of people and they're different, that's, that, that's ludicrous. And so what's happening now, we're in a society where – it's like a unspoken. Well, it's not unspoken, but it's it's a it's an expectation that you should look at a woman like she's a man, and you should look at a man not as a man, but just as another person. And we should try to erase these ideas that oh, men act a certain way and women act a certain way, and to treat women a certain way because they are women, people automatically label you sexist, even though treating someone different is not necessarily treating them derogatory or treating them bad. Um, well, it's so also, I, just, I think that's a, the distinction you make or you guys make is that uh, it's no longer a matter of biology. It's gender as a mental societal construct, yeah, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a social construct, construct which, is, which is bizarre because, I mean, we know from science that, <laughs> I mean, men and women have different genetics. It's, it's nothing social about it. But for some reason, that false uh, narrative is able to make its way around social media and, and around the world 150 times. Uh, a second <laughs> without being challenged uh, seriously right I mean and that's actually um, let come up presently let me just get something in here it's that this James Damore guy at Google actually wrote a paper as to why some women aren't in tech and his basic summation was men and women's interests are different and he got fired <laughs> so you know it's uh, it's actually a present issue I used to be the president of a semi-national corporation's diversity council. And let me tell you, you never met people with less of a clue about true diversity than the people who were in that council. Uh, because they were just sort of uh, modern types who I came away realizing that to them, diversity meant uniformity. <laughs> right, so diversity wasn't about, hey, everybody, we're all different and let's tolerate each other. No, it was about let's pretend we're all the same. I mean, it's totally messed up. Like I'll give you one specific example. One of them said, oh, we should do something for St. Valentine's Day because that's coming up. And then he caught himself and he said, oh, oh, but we can't call it St. Valentine's Day because that might offend somebody. <laughs> and I said to him, well, wait a minute. We're the diversity council, so if someone gets offended, we explain to them that they should be tolerant. I mean, isn't that our job? I mean, it was unbelievable the way that these people thought, and I'm afraid, actually, they didn't think, really. They felt their way through issues, which is exactly what's going on now. That's another part of the art of war, is the purposeful dumbing down leads to uh, a feelings-based culture because I don't have to have a great intellect and really think through issues to have a feeling. Everybody has feelings. So that's why we're to the point where, hey, if I feel something, then it's true. And if, if you disagree with my feeling, then you're wrong. And I'm offended. <laughs> yeah. And one of the consequences of this um, – redefining what it means to be a man and a woman and, and mixing up the genders um, is that it destroys the family totally. 
I mean, when you attack the male and female binary, when you attack um, how men are to, ought to be and how women ought to be, it's going to have an effect on family from a societal perspective. Um, and, and we know that postgenerism is rooted in the occult, and this is what the occult wanted. Uh, I believe Alistair Crowley um, said family uh, is enemy number one. So when the occult, when, when the, um, occult, when they're doing their thing, when they're trying to um, make moves onto the civilization, the first thing they're going to target is the family, and they're doing that through the feminist movement and postgenerism. And you'll find that any oppressive tyranny through history has always viewed the family as the enemy. And I would think that it's because, this, in essence, a family is a micro-government within a macro-government. And they hate the competition, right? Because no matter what is going on in public schools today, I can still tell my family whatever I want in the privacy of our own home. So that can't be tolerated anymore. Yeah. I, I, I agree wholeheartedly. You know, it seems, it seems like everybody's, you know, they, well, not everybody. I shouldn't say everybody because it's not everybody. It's really mainstream media and propaganda pushing this stuff. Like everybody's really bored when that's just not the case. Um, but one thing people don't talk about it, um, are the consequences that are, um, that are coming out of this redefining society and redefining family. Like, did you know that the, uh, in America, singleness is at an all-time all high. People are having problems getting married. Um, and I, I think that's a, a, a clear reflection of what redefining family and what gender uh, is about. So that, that is absolutely true. And it's also statistically the more secular a society becomes, the less children they have. That's just standard. But, you know, you hit upon a very uh, important point I'd like to emphasize for a minute, which is when you caught yourself referring to everybody. Um, so I hope that it's obvious, but I'll point it out that we see, I see a huge difference between an individual who, who is dealing with these issues on the one hand and then the militant movement on the other hand, right? Yep. I mean... Uh, I'll give you an example. Okay, so a few months ago, we went to a local bar to listen to a band, and there was a guy there in a dress, essentially. He was a, you know, a cross-dresser, and this was ugly. I mean, horrendous. Uh, the guy looked like John Goodman from The Roseanne Show, oh, no. and he's wearing a wig and a dress. He looked just horrendously bad, just ugly as you could imagine. And I was thinking to myself, you know... Not too long ago, that guy would have had a hard time coming in here because somebody would have got in his face about it. Yes. Uh, where today, you know, they get the red card rolled out. And then I thought to myself, you know what? As much as I absolutely disagree with what he's doing, if somebody did get up on his face, I would get on his side and protect him. No questions asked, even if it got physical. Because I love him as someone who's made in God's image. Point blank, no question about it. I would fight for him, not against him in that way. So my point is, yeah, I'm 100% against this movement and what it's doing, but I absolutely adore the individuals, and my heart breaks for them. I mean, it's William and I were just talking before uh, we started recording this this session. Is man, just it's heartbreaking. It's totally tra tragic what's going on in these people's lives yeah ab ab absolutely um uh, and, and that's why i don't understand the people that want to encourage the the lifestyles that are destroying people from a christian perspective what is loving is to tell your neighbor the truth um if someone's walking on a pathway and 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 further along on the pathway, there's a hole. I mean, is it loving to not say anything? Or is right. it loving to say, can you see on that path and you see this person headed towards destruction? And so, and that's why my, my issue is not with individuals. It's with the powers. Exactly. That, it, it's with the powers that be that's trying to get some type of agenda accomplished and they're using people like people aren't individuals, which is evil, which is wrong. Um, you know, a person that is, uh, you know, 
in the, the, the homosexual or the transgender lifestyle or bisexual, you know, they have something they need help with. It's not a situation where we should encourage, you know, the destruction of their bodies. Um, so I, I'm, I'm with you on that. I mean, that's actually an interesting point because there's a big study about a lot of these guys who go sex change and it's like, is this really the solution may be a psychological solution, not a physical one, right? That brings us directly into if we want to get into the medical side of this a little bit. Um, let me kind of um, mention something. There's a certain Dr. Kenneth Zucker. Okay, and he's considered extremely controversial <laughs> because his basic point and and working in the Center for Addiction and Mental Health in Canada, specifically in the Gender Identity Clinic. And Dr. Zucker also served on the work groups for the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, uh, number four, so the DSM, right? Um, he's considered radical because what he was saying about dealing with children um, in dealing with trans issues is pointing out the well-known fact by, by those who look into this stuff that for children, this is very much just a phase, just like they go through many different kind of phases in their youth, and they just grow out of them. So his point is we need to help these children deal with what they're going through. We don't need to start pumping them full of drugs and putting them through surgery to, to essentially be parent activists to force their children into doing things to their bodies that, like we said before, can only be reversed to a certain degree. You know, so, if, if I could inject real quick, yeah. if, and it makes no sense, but if a child says, hey, mommy or daddy, I think I'm a dragon, how do we respond to that? You know, it, it sounds crazy, but if you use the logic that, oh, if a child identifies internally as a thing, then that may be so, even though outwardly we know that's not the case. I mean, if a child identifies as a unicorn, do we begin transitioning in, into a unicorn? <laughs> yeah, so, so let me, you're right. You're absolutely right about that. But, but that's because it all breaks down to spiritual warfare. And what we really care about as people who rebel against God is to destroy the male and female genders, right? I mean, if we can get into CRISPR gene editing to the point where we're adding DNA from other species into our bodies, that's just, that'll be transhumanist icing on the cake, really. <laughs> but what Dr. Zucker did is, for example, he put out a, he was part of, I should say, a documentary called Transgender Children, Who Knows Best? And that was his point, is who knows best? Why are we make, letting children make these radical decisions? And of course, a lot of times, it's not the children doing it. But it's the parents who instantly, you know, a, a boy grabs the doll and all of a sudden the parents are saying, that's it. You're going to transition. I mean, it's crazy. It's, that's simplified. But it's, it's kind of like that. And incidentally, that was a documentary released by the BBC over in the UK, right? So when I went to their website to try to view it, it's, it could tell by my address that I'm in the United States and it said it was not allowed to be viewed from the United States for some reason. Wow. Amazing. Now I have heard rumors that, Oh, I don't know. Somebody went into the matrix and pulled it out. So on certain people's websites, you can actually still watch it in the United States, but you didn't hear that from me. Gotcha. Um, so <laughs> what happened? What was the Dr. title of it again? It was uh post children. Oh, gotcha. Who knows best. Okay, that. so what happened with Zucker is he ended up getting fired from where he worked. And I wrote to the clinic and I said, well, have you guys made a public statement about why he was fired? And they said, well, no, we haven't. But that they did post the review that was done. They had a, an outside agency come in and review their clinic. And that's what led to his firing. So I was able to read that. And here's some examples of what the review stated. 
it says research knowledge and clinic guidelines. Oh, sorry, research knowledge and clinical guidelines have evolved, particularly in the last five years, and society's understanding and acceptance of the diversity of gender expressions and identity have changed. There appears to be a mismatch between the literature research findings, including those from the gender identity clinic itself, and the clinical practice and approach. Okay, and this is why I subtitled my book and the history of changes to psychiatry and psychology because it happened with homosexuality prior to this, before, and the literature, it was affirmed that homosexuality was a mental disorder. Well, that changed. And guess what? The science didn't change. Culture changed. So this is exactly what they're saying here. I mean, um, research knowledge and clinical guidelines have evolved. Okay, they didn't evolve. <laughs> they were designed. It's not bland, blind, random, and unguided. This was done purposefully. So what we're finding is that psychology and psychiatry are changing not due to science but due to social political activism. Here's another thing they say. They recommend refrain from treatment of children that targets reduction of gender variant behaviors or use of language that pathologizes these. Okay, so in other words, don't treat the kids so that their gender variant uh, variant behaviors will decrease. You can't do that anymore. You can't even talk in terms of that being a pathology because now it's perfectly normal and natural. And here's also what they say. Listen to this one. Refrain from allowing parents alone to choose the treatment path. Wow. So that could go both ways, yeah. you know. Um, like, for instance, if a parent wants to shove their children through the system, Hopefully, they'll receive some kickback, but if the parent wants to stop their child from transitioning, they'll also receive some, some pushback is what I meant, not kickback, pushback. And then they're talking about how the clinic as a whole are encouraged to develop a campaign towards collaborative creation of safe spaces for transgender children, youth, families, and community caregivers. And so that, that's why in the medical field, things are not changing due to science. Again, they're changing due to social political activism. And the, the literature, the official literature on all this stuff uh, from when homosexuality was changed, when the view on it was changed, to now with the trans movement, the literature is very open about that. I'm not just reading that into it. I'm not just making that up as an observation. They are extremely open about that. That's why it's changing. Yeah, and it seems like it's it's the same thing happening for transgenderism that happened for homosexuality. Exactly. I, mean, I, I think that's what you're saying. Right. Um, and I, I find it also fascinating how the powers that be are pushing and, and in some cases financing uh, for children to transition into another sex, while at the same time, states are writing laws to ban um, children, and they propose some legislation for adults, but to ban children uh, from undergoing any type of conversion therapy. So, uh, so they're trying to, uh, um, they're trying to say it's wrong to try to change a person's sexual orientation, but then it's okay to change your sex. <laughs> it's like, well, Good I, point, I, how did you come to that conclusion? Yeah, maybe it's something, well, yeah. that's something you can talk to uh, more about, Nicholas, is all of these changes in California, New York, Harvard University that, you know, are about these kind of gender rules. Yeah, there's a there's an endless amount of changes that are going on. I mean, it seems like literally every day there is some new piece of legislation being written in some state that's, um, you know, in a sense, it sounds like it's uh, um, it's uh, liberating people, but a lot of times it's restricting people's rights to be able to do certain things. Um, but uh, as you as we were talking about earlier, there's been changes in um, how some schools. Um, um, how some schools function. Like there's been, there are some school districts in our 
a country that tell teachers or forbid teachers from calling children boys and girls. They're not supposed to um, assume their gender. They're just supposed to call them students. And so what, what, what that's going to do is it's tr they're trying to um, have children grow up without a concept of being a boy or a girl. And I don't, I don't, I didn't find any research because there's, there's no research to really uh, uh, find out how that's going to affect those communities long term. I mean, they just started doing this. This is something that just started to happen. It's just started happening within the last decade. Um, but let me, let me, uh, let me find a few things. Sorry, I was kind of. That's all right. But there was like, I think you talked about Harvard University are disencouraged, not encouraging all me all male and female clubs anymore uh they're not they're actually saying people aren't eligible for certain scholarships or leadership um, yeah, yeah. Now, now we're seeing the destruction of the boy scouts right it's so, just basic basic uh common sense level traditional concepts now nowadays you cannot affirm verifiable three-dimensional physical reality anymore that's what makes you crazy and intolerant right. well didn't some guy get fired for saying women don't have penises i think he said something like that and people came after him one of the interesting points about these changes is these changes are being done by a very small vocal minority right i mean it can't be more than two four or five percent of the population get that well see that's what you find in a lot of these cases is if if one single person or one couple in an entire state complains about something the laws are changed in their favor it's That's unbelievable amazing. yeah it doesn't make sense while nicholas is looking that up let me mention something um about dr phil right dr phil mcgraw right and uh, I, I love watching his show um, as an example of professing themselves to be wise they became fools you know what <laughs> So, for instance, he had on uh, Rachel Dolezal, right? You remember her? Yeah, very well, yes. Yeah, so she is an Anglo-American, and she claimed that she was African-American. And so he has her on the show telling her that, no, you're not African-American, you're Anglo-American, and it's wrong for you to be claiming to be something you're not. And she's talking about self-identification, and he's pushing back, like, no. You don't have the right to claim that you're an African American when you're not, okay? Uh, but then when Dr. Phil has on a trans person, all of a sudden, hey, you know what? You are whatever you say you are. You're the opposite of what you 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 claim to be. The opposite of what you are, then that's what you are. And he does a total 180 reversal on it. Uh, he cannot be consistent on that. Uh, for example, another example, Dr. Phil had on a tragic case of a woman who had perfect eyesight but she self-identified as being blind so she got some advice from somebody who told her to pour um, uh, car engine antifreeze into her eyes so basically she destroyed her eyes and she destroyed her vision and now she's blind okay and he's telling her how crazy, you know, he didn't use the word crazy, but how crazy that was and how the people who advised her to do that were unethical and he's completely against it, of course. But when it's not an eye, when it's a different organ, when that organ is between your legs and you go to the Dr. Phil show, all of a sudden that you purposely destroyed a perfectly healthy functioning organ because you self-identified as something you were not all of a sudden it's perfectly normal and natural and healthy and he's all behind it i mean he's so absolutely inconsistent well i think part of that inconsistency uh comes from the pressure uh that he may have just been in the media um i mean we see i mean the most of the media um, and I think that's fair to say they they support these ideas. I mean, we we see um, the propaganda in movies, TV shows, talk shows. It's everywhere. And absolutely, if you're, you're going to have screen time, then it's either you get with the narrative, or right. we don't want to hear what you have to say because you're not going to push our agenda. Um, so, if Dr. Phil, he has a large platform. I'm pretty sure if he doesn't go along with uh, the um, the 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 gender confusion craze, there's going to be people that say, well, we're going to make it hard for you to continue to, to do what you're doing. 
Um, and also because he is involved in psychology and or psychiatry. So then he's stuck in, in another bind, which is that's the way those fields are going. So in order to still be credible in those fields, that's what he's going with. Yeah, which it, it's, it's so funny how that works because it's almost like you're not really being an expert in a field. You're just agreeing to what the field masters say. <laughs> so we're not we're not we're not basing our understanding on facts and, and logic and reality. We're basing our understanding on well whatever they want me to say so I can maintain my position. Exactly. Yeah, that was my point about how it's not based on science. It's based on social political activism. <clears throat> right. So we're at the three minute mark. We got three minutes to go. Do you guys wanna kind of wrap it up? So where can people get your books and where can they see your material? Go ahead, so, Nicholas. Yeah, sure. Uh, my book, Postgenderism, War on the Binary, you can find it on Amazon. Uh, if you Google Postgenderism, War on the Binary, it should pop up. Um, or you can go to my website, clearelephant.com, and purchase it there. Um, and if you want to contact me, I also have contact, uh, I have a contact form on my uh, website if you want to get in contact with me. So it's clear, what did you say, clear elephant, all one word? Yeah, clearelephant.com. Dot com, gotcha. And I, and I may need to explain what clear elephant is really quick. It's basically the term. <laughs> it's basically the term I came up with to describe a situation that has gone so long without being checked that people uh, get Stockholm syndrome with the issue. So I use the example of single motherhood. Uh, Thirty years ago, we knew it was wrong, but because society didn't didn't deal with the growing a number of single mothers. Now, if you say single motherhood is wrong, people defend it. They get mad at you for saying that, like you said something wrong, when that should right. just be given. Good point. So the elephant's been in the room so long, but it's been ignored so long that it becomes clear and visible. Exactly. That's a Thank good you. one. I like that. I'm going to steal yeah. that from you. <laughs> <laughs> and Ken, your website is truefreethinker.com. All your books can be purchased, including this one, at your website, correct? Correct. And if you go and buy my book and Nicholas's book, you can definitely say that you were at the forefront of this new crazy movement. Yeah. I mean, it's really important. They're both great books. I've read them both. I definitely recommend them in addition to all your other books, Ken. And uh, thank you very much for being on the show. Really appreciate it. And uh, we should probably pick this topic up in the future and, and kind of look at it from uh, kind of media, you know, much more uh, looking in to see what's going on, Jordan Peterson, all these other kind of movements around the country. But thank you for being on the show. I appreciate it. Thank you for having us. Thanks for having us.